your father was a a very popular film director, and I would have imagined that that was a major influence in in the direction of your life. Well, you're right because I grew up essentially in an entertainment family. Mom was a, a stage and musical star on the stage, and then made a, a transition to Hollywood for a while, and then uh, and then retired about 1934, long before I was born. Uh, but uh, but I was seeped in the tradition of filmmaking, so essentially I had spent a lot of time on sets with my dad during the years, and I was always curious and fascinated about how uh, films were made and uh, the collaboration that was necessary in order to to make a movie. I, 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 I was staggering to a 10-year-old to see how many people involved in the actual making of the film. And also, as far as the cinematographer was concerned, the close relationship between uh, the director and the cinematographer. I thought that was a very interesting, a very interesting dynamic. Mm-hmm. And then, in conjunction to that, I grew up in a neighborhood in which there were two or three well-known cinematographers that lived there, and I used to spend time talking to them because they had sons or daughters. And they used to take me into the dark room and show me, uh, you know, how to develop film and how, what the processes were. And I was fascinated by what it is they had to say. It was Bob Surtees was one of them. Ernest Haller was another. James Wong Howe, and then later on it was wow. Russell Met. Wow. Mm. So I was very fortunate to have that introduction uh, into into the into the process, and of course it sparked my interest. And I'd always. On my own, and had I not been born into this family, I would have still been captivated by films because there was nothing more interesting or fun for me to do when I was a kid than sit in the darkened theater and watch images wash over me. I always thought that was absolutely fascinating. Uh, And when I became of age and knew that my dad was involved in the making of these, you know, that impressed me. (laughs) And consequently, Mm -hmm. most of my family was involved, and so that you know, there it lights lights the spark. Well, you talk about the interaction you had with with various cinematographers, and I'm I'm wondering was there an aha moment where you felt this should be my life's direction, cinematography, that, that this matches my sensibility? Yes, there were there were times in which um, it progressively led up to it. Uh, as soon as I was around 14 or 15 years old, I got a hold of a still camera. And I started taking pictures, and that again, at that point, sparked my interest again because it brought me back to those days in which a cinematographer was developing his own material in his dark room, such as still, uh, you know, as as still photographs. Mm-hmm. And I thought this would be a worthy occupation to uh, pursue, although I had no idea how I would go about that at the time. And there was, uh, I think that. What really cinched it for me ultimately was one day when I was uh, in college, out in the hallway, Leon Shamroy happened to be uh, shooting a film that was called The Glass Bottom Boat or something to that effect. And I remember watching him very closely and how interesting it was to see how he orchestrated the crews and how he dealt with the various situations that he was involved with. So I spent two or three hours just observing and uh, I was captivated by the whole thing. And then again, of course, it sparked that interest that I had when I was young, uh, once again, to pursue this. Because, it, 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 frankly, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do with my life until essentially getting the still camera, working with these particular people or being able to observe them, and then listening to my, my father speak so highly of what cinematographers did. And so I think it was an amalgam of things that sparked the interest for me to pursue this and realize that this is what I should do with my life. Sure. And looking over your resume, I mean, when you when you first started in television and film, um, such incredible projects that you that you were a part of, from from Planet of the Apes to to Butch Cassidy, and I'm sure that you learned so much during those early years in your career. But were there um, observations that you made or lessons that you learned that uh, that you still carry with you today that proved to be most important to you? Yes, I think that well, much much of what you observe and, and learn as coming up through the ranks in the studio system, as I did, uh, is a respect for fellow craftsmen and the uh, the 
collaboration between the director and the cinematographer and the feeling that is so necessary to impart upon the picture you know based on based on the story that you're shooting and so each of those little nuggets of information that you uh, observe and pick up are always part of your arsenal you know that you that you use Mm -hmm. did you always feel though because um, obviously filmmaking is a unique art form in that it's it's that great mixture between the the artistic and the technical and how those two intermingle did you but did you always feel kind of adept at the art of storytelling there was always an interest in in the in the form of storytelling whether it be uh visually or literally uh, or or literarily i always uh, enjoyed the sense of adventure that storytelling provided i always thought that it was always interesting to see how an author put on paper his narrative thoughts in a cohesive fashion in order to structure a plot, a theme, mm-hmm. and ultimately the novel. I, I was fascinated by the process. Unfortunately, I had no skill as a writer, but I could take some of those <coughs> points and apply it to cinematography, which I hope in some way, uh, you know, that I was successful in doing it really is a collaborative effort between primarily the director and the cinematographer and it's incumbent upon us to provide a visual signature for that picture that's going to support the story uh so uh, in that context uh i am a, you know part of the storytelling process which i think is an integral part each person that works on a film um there's that delineation between um performing the job and 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 investing so much in it that it becomes an art form i think we're talking about jerry goldsmith yesterday and we're dissecting some of his film scores and yeah. uh and and looking at the the subtext of a of a movie that he worked on and how different elements of his score brought out the most of those elements um and i think that that's what transcended in, into the realm of art is it a struggle for you to balance between what is what can practically be done with the resources you have and, and what and what you want to achieve artistically with a project that has always been a, a constant uh concern and and battle Fortunately, later on in my career, I was given a great deal of latitude in terms of budget and time, uh, so that those issues were certainly not as much of a concern. But early on when I was starting, all of those elements of uh, compatibility in terms of budget and uh, and and uh, and uh, sets and ability to be able to make the film were were problematic, and each had to be dealt with in a specific way. And it was frustrating at times when you knew that there were certain things that you could do to enhance the story, but yet because of physical or financial limitations, uh, it wasn't uh, it wasn't possible. And I, I'll give you an example of this. Uh, you know, one of the earliest films I did uh, was uh, The Breakfast Club. Mm-hmm. And in so doing, that particular show, I came on about uh, three, only three and a half or four weeks before production started, in Des Plaines, Illinois. Now the set had already been built in uh, in a gym, and the production designer, in order to keep the scope of the set as large as it possibly could be to give some grandeur and vista to this, had built all the way to the ceilings. Now it was unfortunate for me because it, what it negated with for me was the ability to use shafts of sunlight, which I would have preferred to do on both sides in order to advance the story in terms of times of day and also to provide contrast to the actors in which some could occasionally be in silhouette when they were being a recessive in their character and then brightly lit when, of course, they were being uh, extroverted and strongly uh, presentational. Mm -hmm. And I was robbed of that ability, but that was an initial concept that I had when I first read the script. But the realities of the set as it was built and had been built by the time I arrived, was that it was a closed box. So the other thought that came to me was, after wrestling with it for a while, is that the story basically is about the tedium of detention. And with the 
override, overriding um, theme of uh, coming of age and the angst that young people in high school certainly have in each of the individual delineated characters that were so finely honed by Hughes, uh, you know, we're, we're all in this particular unique dynamic. But I thought mm. the overall feel of the picture now, because of the lack of certain set designs elements that I wished I would have had at the time, uh, brought me to the conclusion that I wanted to present it in a way that it felt to the audience claustrophobic and tedious. And so I thought, oh, I remunerated about this particular thought for a while, and I finally went to John with the idea. And uh, I told him that what I would like to do is is really not move the camera. And what I would also further like to do is like to keep it kind of essentially uh, even and the and, and bring the densities down on the face so that, that there was a sense of tedium throughout the entire show. There was no essential visual relief so that mm. the audience could, uh, for example, oh, wow, is that a beautiful shot or not? That wasn't right. the point. The point was to enhance the story through the sense of tedium in the set. And the way I could do that was by having a static camera, keeping the light somewhat on the full side, and the only uh, 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 touch, and, and well, basically, uh, it was a sense of, of throwing out or getting rid of any uh, theatrical conceit. Right. And it seemed and that, to work quite effectively. It, well, yes, th- I think that's very safe to say. Uh, but that, that static camera, I mean, it also, like you say, it, it reinforces the notion that th- those characters are stuck. <laughs> yeah. You know, oh, absolutely. Yeah. The, the sense of rigidity of the camera matches the sense of rigidity uh, of, uh, of also uh, the prefect of discipline, whoever that, you know, that character, I can't remember what that character's, uh, I think as he was in charge of the uh, uh, study hall or something at that particular mm. time, but it was, it kind of reinforced his rigidity. So I thought yeah, that, that thematically yeah. worked, worked quite well. So, you know, that was, uh, that was essentially compromising. Uh, to the extent that it affected the visual dynamic of the picture. But I can't say that it was uh, uh, a distraction to it. I, I can't say positively that my original plan, had it been carried out, would have been any more successful in advancing the story than what it is that I ultimately achieved. Um, I'd be remiss not to ask you about working with John Hughes, because for for many of us, he is such a he was such an elusive figure um but such an epic one for for those that grew up during that period of time but what was he like to collaborate with uh, john john by nature um uh, is uh, well i think you 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 put your finger on it he's somewhat reclusive in the sense that he is uh really essentially shy and his world exists within his mind and then is translated to paper I've never known anyone who had his pulse on the youth in terms of the angst that they feel or the stories they need to tell than John Hughes. But getting back to your question, how was it like to work with him? He was very, very interested in anything that I brought to the table as far as cinema was concerned. Uh, he had, and I must say honestly that... Uh, that he is a, a really an actor's director, and he's essentially story driven. He's not one of these directors that is uh, a masterful with camera technique or stylization. That's not something that he he involves himself in. He has a general sense of what he would like, and you are responsible then for convincing him otherwise of another approach. But he was very open to whatever it is that I had to say in terms of how the movie could be presented in its in its best light and he was always very uh, supportive john would spend most of his time off the set working with the actors and then when i was ready he'd come in and john would kick off his shoes and generally lay on the floor underneath the camera with propping his head up on his, on his elbows and he would watch the scene and he'd do it two or three takes and he'd say cut and then he'd roll over on his back and just say, "Okay, let's move on." <laughs> so it was amusing in that sense. <laughs> wow! But, but Breakfast Club, just just like Stand by Me, 
I mean, these are these are two films you did very close to one another. Um, they're they're both ensembles. They both have a kind of a large principal cast. Uh, what are the challenges specific to shooting an ensemble-like film? Well, generally, what you normally have in an ensemble film is uh, it, you're burdened essentially or frequently with excessive coverage uh, because mm. each of these characters, in theory, should be covered individually in order to keep the pace of the piece or in order to uh, eliminate certain people from a particular scene in case the performance is not working. And so in an ensemble piece, you're faced with this dilemma of who to cover and who not to cover. But in the case of The Breakfast Club, the byplay was essentially between a minimum of two to four characters simultaneously. So frequently, it, was not, it, it wasn't covered particularly as you would do it normally. It harkened back to what you would normally see in a tableau type of shot from the 30s and 40s in which two or three people would essentially carry the scene in one particular shot without really any intercuts. And so I think that the dialogue came with such rapidity and the reactions of the kids all depended upon being in the scene simultaneously that we spent as much time as possible trying to perfect the master and the medium shots uh, to the degree where it wasn't necessary for us to go in for single coverage, except mm -hmm. on those particular situations in which the cast was spread out, so you were required to cut between back and forth. But, but when you're when you're collaborating with the director and you're trying to establish how he wants the scene blocked, and that will determine how you sh shoot the scene. It, does it feel like it's more strict when you're dealing with multiple characters like that? Well, there are certain elements in the scene that have to be addressed in terms of uh, who has the basic, uh, who has, who's driving that particular scene is an important part of how it's staged. And the blocking of the scene uh, frequently can become convoluted and uh, and confusing if uh, you don't have a clear understanding of lines of sight in terms of where the characters are to one another and how they will relate to each other in the editorial frame. So when a director is blocking, I am with him and I support him in this endeavor. Uh, but if I feel that the blocking as it exists is going to cause a tremendous delay either in time or in uh, uh, in cutting, then you know it's my obligation to say so. And then, of course, we can always adjust um, that particular actor, or essentially the camera, in some way, uh, in order to accommodate this this new dynamic. So, working with a large number of people in one particular scene is always a challenge. And uh, I must say that I've probably done more of that than most people because I'm I'm I've usually done a lot of pictures with you know seven or eight nine people in the scene, and I, I, I that continued even into my television work. So you absolutely like have yes, yeah. And I'm I've been I was thinking that because when we're talking about the the kind of uh, constrictive location of The Breakfast Club, and I'm thinking about my, my favorite television show in the history of television, The West Wing. Uh, yeah. I mean, you were you were confined to that White House set for, for much of that series, and that must have been a um, particular challenge to, to keep, the, keep it diverse enough not to be so repetitive in that location. Yeah, and I think that uh, everybody uh, essentially was a was a strong participant in that. And my feeling about the uh, about the look specifically of the West Wing uh, had to do basically with truth and lies, and then half truth. And so, what I did was try to put as much contrast into that show as I possibly can in shadows. And then mm -hmm. occasionally I would have extremely bright lights that would floor down from the ceiling, not in, not dissimilar from what you might see in an office, but highly theatricalized and exaggerated as punctuation, which aided in the rapidity of walking and the telling of dialogue. Because when you walked under one of those lights, even at a normal pace, it would flash on the screen as yes. though there was this moment of high overexposure, and then it would settle off into... Uh, a shadow again, which I found to be visually interesting and also added to the dynamic of the shot. And also the directors and myself could play 
the dialogue against that particular type of lighting in which if uh, if there were half truths being told i might very well be shooting a person in silhouette against blinds and then the other person is fully lit you know who is absorbing this particular information or in the case of uh, uh of uh of a demonstrative declaration which is a lot of those that occurred in west wing I might put a very bright light over the top of the person and the table, and and and, and it would be very strong and overexposed, in order mm-hmm. to accentuate the strength of what this person had to say uh, against the contrast of the other people in attendance. So I thought there was a, a, a unique visual dynamic that went into that show, and and for some reason uh, never got stale. So yeah, we, we were yeah. very happy with that. Speaking of location, I, I think of a film like Stand By Me where uh, the, the the world that these kids inhabit is is its own character. The the feeling of that of that time period and that, that town. Um h- how crucial was location to, to, to developing the visual structure of that particular film? Well, the location actually dictated the visual style of the picture. Uh, since it took place basically in and around forests and small towns, uh, there was kind of a, a sense of high contrast reality to these particular forests. And, you know, you have these hot patches of light that come down through pine trees, and they're blindingly light. And then, of course, when somebody walks out of it, you're you're into uh, definite shadow and, and occasionally uh, no exposure whatsoever. So the most difficult thing was to get the forest, which is probably two-thirds of the film, to be ideally romanticized. That was my task in terms of what it is that I wanted to do with the film because this was a coming-of-age story with a slight edge, but not enough edge that you'd want to place it in the realm of reality. This is told, you know, in retrospect through the eyes Mm -hmm. of someone who experienced it. So for me, romanticizing and etherealizing a lot of that particular show was was necessary. So consequently, much of it, what I had to do was wait for the right light, wait for uh, uh, you know backlight, or swing scenes around in order to take advantage of less contrast, because the contrast is a detriment to uh, the romanticization of an image. It has more to do with uh, with strife and and, uh, and drama as opposed to. Uh, the coming of age and the opening up of a of a boy's life in front of him. Mm-hmm. That movie has really carried on such an enormous legacy. What, what were you telling me the other uh, yesterday that there there's a it, is it today there's a special day reserved for it in Oregon? <laughs> As a matter of fact, there is a special day in Oregon for it, and it's uh, it's it was it has been every five years they've done. A retrospective in the particular town in which it's done, in which they invite everybody that's participated, and some, you know, a few show up. Some are not available, but they have a town party celebrating this particular film, and wow. it has become quite, uh, quite uh, an event in the state of Oregon. And as a matter of fact, CBS is going to be doing a documentary on that uh, very same subject, which I'll participate in later on uh, this year for broadcast. I, I think I think it's going to be a, a CBS broadcast on, you know, on a national level because of the irony of, uh, well, the iconic standards of, of the picture and, and what it's done to the state of, uh, state of Oregon. That's got to be particularly satisfying for you when, you're, when your films live. I mean, that's, that's really why you're in it, I'm sure. Well, yes, it's the, yeah, it it is, it, it is the, it, for me, it always was the attempt to convey an image more interestingly. And I must say, and I think most cinematographers may say this, that that I have never found the perfect shot. I have never, on any particular show, I've come close, but I have never been totally satisfied with 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 any particular shot there there i've come as i say i've come close many 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 times but there is this kind of uh grasp that i have for an image that is not quite attainable and i noticed this very early in my career when i was first hired uh universal moved me up as a dp uh in 79 
And very quickly, I got my first feature. It was United Artists picture. It was called Aces. And it was a story, essentially, that took place underground in parking structures. And uh, But it was a youth-oriented particular picture, and uh, and it, that, that had to satisfy its own visual requirements because there, uh, there is a difference in the sense of what the marketing abilities of the film are. But it was mildly successful as a youth-oriented film, and and uh, consequently, uh, I had done another a couple of other dramas immediately after that. But then I got hired again to do more youth-oriented particular pictures, and those have their own palette. These particular shows, they they tend to be uh, stylized or romanticized. It provides a, a kind of a softness to the image because of the material that you're dealing with. And so how I could mm-hmm. control that was by controlling costume colors and, you know, kind of muting it so that it wasn't so uh, so so problematic in terms of storytelling. But it's been a problem for me after, and it's essentially typecasting. I uh, After I had done two or three successful movies, and especially after Breakfast Club and Stand By Me, uh, almost every youth-oriented film in the business was coming my way for quite some years, and 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 as I, you can see on my resume, there uh, many of them, uh, you know, were done with this series of um, "Look Who's Talking" and uh, then the Mighty Ducks subsequent to that. So, in some ways, um, that was somewhat disappointing to me because I always felt that I was a stronger dramatist than I was doing these particular light-hearted films, although as Mm. iconic as they became and as important to storytelling as they are, I still wish that I was doing more drama, and I found that the only place that I could do that successfully was by transitioning into television. Mm -hmm. And uh, And that was an area that had its own particular problems, but at least I was tackling an image uh, and the sensibilities in which I felt that I was I was strongest, but then of course you have the sacrifice of time and uh, and money, which is unique, well, which is uh, typical of of the television. But uh, at least I was satisfying on a creative end uh, a certain desire that I had. Yeah, but the the the, the television medium also moves at such a, a rapid pace. Um, do you feel that that ticking clock is a, a detriment, or or do you kind of get excited by the energy of that? I admire the cinematographers who specialize and do television and have done it all their lives, because what they're doing is they are essentially creating wonderful images within a very, very strict time frame. And they are doing remarkably good work, and I could say specifically today, or at least within the last five years, that... Uh, 75% of the television that is being photographed today, and I namely mean Showtime and HBO and the pay channels, uh, Mm -hmm. equals or surpasses in many ways uh, uh, feature films. Uh, Films today are are, uh, unfortunately uh, special effects is, is the star of the particular picture. And the story nowadays, as written, is 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 really supporting the special effects as opposed to the special effects supporting the story. So I think um, uh, so. I, I think that there has been a resurgence of storytelling in, te- in television on a level that has not ever been seen before, and it's been a privilege to be part of that uh, transition because it is the only true medium in which you can tell a narrative-driven story uh, with complexity uh, completely, you you don't have the the time or the uh, audience participation in a feature film in order to do it. It must be done on television. So I applaud that as far as the medium is concerned. Is it a challenge not to step on the director's toes in terms of how you interact with the actors? Do you find that you often need to interact with the actors at all? Well, you interact with the actors on the, in the sense of blocking and staging. Uh, you, you with the director are really guiding the actors where they need to be. Of course, the director is the one who essentially initiates the blocking, and I'm the one that happens to be there, to which I can change the blocking uh, in conjunction with him by simply uh, asking him if it's okay if I speak to them and have them move over by the table, and they always grant that. So that's always a collaborative process, and I never feel that I'm stepping on their toes because I always know who's boss. <laughs> I know who's boss. <laughs> so, 
you know, there and there's no point in being a bull in a china shop, which I have been accused of on occasion during during my life. But you know, those are uh, well, those are moments that happen. But nonetheless, you know, you you uh, you you work with them, uh, you work with the actors essentially on a social level as a cinematographer, as opposed to a professional level, because you're certainly not guiding performances. You're just dealing with them in terms of uh, blocking or particular angles of the face or particular uh, arm movements, you know, that may be affecting another actor. So that is basically the limit. If you were to pick out from the history of a uh, uh, film, your knowledge of it. The- three or so films that you would use as, as as teaching examples if you're teaching cinematography which ones would they be um let's see one would be the stylization of uh, butch cassidy and the sundance kid would be one the other i think which is um an immense help to the story was uh, the Saving Private Ryan today, mm. because that is probably the most realistic portrayal of combat that uh, you know that I have ever seen. And the manipulation of the camera and development processes, you know, was was brilliant and unique uh, onto itself. And then, of course, there is a an ancient film which I would have have recommended was Intolerance. So those are. Yeah. Some of the films, you know, that I would, uh, you know, certainly recommend, and also they're not to be discounted, are some of the Todd Browning movies that were done at Universal in the 30s, in which uh, Universal was uh, making its mark uh, in theatrical distribution by doing horror films. There's some wonderful examples of black and white and use of contrast in those mm. particular uh, sh- films that, uh, you know, are, are magnificent. Have you worked in black and white? Well, by the time I got involved in the business in terms of on a professional level at this at this time, uh, you know, uh, uh, black and white had essentially been phased out. Uh, only the year that I started, uh, there was only one black and white film uh, in contention, and that was Conrad Hall's um, In Cold Blood, I believe it was. In yeah, Cold it's in Blood, Cold Blood, yeah. Yeah, at that particular year, because they had two divisions. They had black and white division, they had a color division, and I believe the color division won. I think he won perhaps for that particular uh, that particular picture. So, no, I didn't get a chance to work in black and white, but as an assistant cameraman and working at a major studio in which I was considered a Fox employee, I was trained to know all the black and white filters and in what combinations they were used in what circumstances and what filter factors had to be applied. So there was a lot of technical knowledge in shooting black and white uh, that was unique to that particular style of shooting in black and white. So mm-hmm. uh, it was something that I always would have liked to have done and tried on several occasions to shoot black and white on some of the pictures that I had done, but there was always so so difficult in terms of getting a release print out of it, so I wound up you know, continuously having to uh, desaturate and increase contrast uh, with color film in order to yeah. approach black and white feeling, and, and occasionally it was fairly successful. Yeah, black and white is a uh, it's a dirty word nowadays in film. <laughs> you can't you can't get anywhere near black and white anymore, which is a shame. It's, it's a shame beautiful. because it's it's a palette that that could be applicable to a lot of pictures that are made. 